Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. That's it. One button. One button. And this adventure is started. It's so crazy. Just one button. I am excited. I'm really excited. I don't think it's coffee because it's not the morning. Um, but I did finish that cup. I'm really excited because my guest today, she is a data-driven marketing leader. And we're going to be talking all about data, how to look at it, how to use it in your marketing. And not only that, she is an official 2020 Salesforce marketing champion. Huge people here talking to us today. Her specialty, I mentioned the data earlier, is measurement, analysis, but also combining the data with visualization and then storytelling to really, to really make that data jump off the page. So it's not just a bunch of numbers, but it actually means something. We're going to talk all about that. She's worked with all sorts of fascinating brands, Starbucks, MGM, GM, even the University of Phoenix. So we're going to get into this. She is currently the Senior Director of Analytics and Business Intelligence at Media Matters Worldwide. Emily Sanders Lee, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Wow, I kind of almost lost myself in your introduction. There's a lot to say. <laughs> that was quite the intro. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, if you want, you can put it on your cell phone as like a wake up. You know, that can be your alarm. It's just like, ladies and gentlemen, Emily. I have like a whole walkout song every morning. Right, like seriously? It. Totally. <laughs> so, all right, let's get into this. The, the show today, it's, it's our marketing champion series. Um, we're going to be talking all about data, all about analytics, measurement, all that good stuff. Um, I'm going to pass you something over here real quick. All right, it's heavy. Ugh. Okay, here we go. You got it? Uh, this is Thor's hammer. Go ahead, take that. Oh, you all got right. it. Okay, cool. I got it. All right. So <laughs> smash for me some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception, and just like set the record straight once and for all. Okay. If you are only looking at your specific campaign metrics within your campaign, okay. and you aren't thinking about it holistically, yep. you're doing it wrong. Ooh. Uh-oh. Now I'm going to think if I'm doing it. So how, <laughs> how do we know if we're, how do we know if we fit that category? Okay. So if you are working in the B2C or even B2B campaign, yep. and you aren't thinking about the client's backend revenue and order data or their actual leads and how those leads are closing, then you aren't thinking of the bigger picture. And this is really mm. important. You need to think about it holistically. Your client is only going to care so much about what the click-through rate was or what the cost per order was. Efficiency is really, really important with campaigns because you wanna make sure that their dollars are being spent wisely. But you also wanna make sure that you are thinking about the bigger picture and pulling in the data that they care about most, that they are speaking about with their team and with their bosses, right? Their CFO, their CEO. You need to make sure that you're speaking the same language as them and giving them the ammo that they need internally so that they can say, this campaign is making a difference and it's, it's moving the needle. Right. You know, I think so many times we use our own languages and our own KPIs. And it's such a huge point that people have their own things that they're looking at and we can't just talk in our own language and think our own stats. They're going to be interested in hearing about click-throughs or something. Totally. Like you, you, we need to ask ourselves more often, well, what does this really mean? What is yeah. this cost per order? What is the, what kind of data can we get access to, to show that the campaign is impacting a specific product on the site? Is it the creative that we're running that is driving the sales of that specific product? Um, having a specific, uh, having a tool like Datarama can pull, where you can pull in all of this data and look at it holistically and show the correlation between marketing and sales is you know, the, the magical picture, the storytelling that you need to share with your um, liaison over on the brand side to say, right. this, is what's, this is what's going on. Huh. Yeah, you know, there's a couple things and I know I definitely want to get into Datarama because I know that 
like me asking you about that is like asking Elon Musk, like how to build a rocket. You just have all this knowledge and, and I want to get into that. Uh, but before we do, uh, you know, even on the, the, the bigger parts of that myth, the idea of looking at it holistically, you mentioned this one phrase, you said, what does this really mean? How, how do you answer that question about a campaign or about some data that you're looking at? What does it even mean? It seems important, but it's like, oh. Yeah, that's, and that is the ultimate question. What does right. this, what does this data really mean? And right. so it's different for every client right. and you need to bring in different tools based on what you're trying to discover. Okay. If you, if, if the campaign is tasked with driving awareness, you still, we still need to be pulling in, um, you know, the order and revenue data and understanding what that's doing for the actual business. But if the campaign is tasked with driving awareness, then there needs to be some sort of measurement tool in place that shows that the campaign moved the needle from an awareness or consideration standpoint. So it's, I, there is no secret sauce, which is Mm. what you know, I think everyone would love that secret sauce. I would certainly buy it if if it was out there. But it's it's different for every every. You think it'd client. be like a pesto, or would it be like a hot sauce, <laughs> like a habanero type? Be like a you know yeah, I'd say like a pesto. <laughs> like a both, like a habanero pesto, maybe. I don't know. Wow, yeah, that would be. I don't know if that would work. <laughs> Somebody should try that. I'm sure it exists. That'd be quite the mixture. Hey, I bet there's someone out there if you're listening and you like the habanero pesto. Do let it now. Yeah, let us know. Send us samples. Only if you like it, though. (laughs) So there's no secret sauce, but you know what I'm getting out of this is understanding what the goal is in mind, and then bringing in the data related to that goal. You know, I think so many times we talk about siloed data, but we talk about marketing data in in isolation. And to your your myth itself, looking at your marketing data may not actually tell you if your campaign's working or not. It may just show you the beginning of it. Um, exactly. you know, at the very beginning, it, someone clicked, but did they actually do anything afterward? Did they do the order? Did your brand increase? Did all those things you wanted to happen? Exactly. And I think it really helps your relationship with mm. your client because yeah. if you are saying that the campaign's performing so well, look at this cost per action, look at this conversion rate, we are killing it. And they're like, well, actually we haven't hit our revenue goal for yeah, the past sales month are down. or so. <laughs> sales are down and right. it's a pandemic and we have to be asking questions like, what is your goal? What is, what is, what is it that is important to you with this campaign? What are, what are the types of numbers that you are conveying to your internal team to say this campaign was successful right these are the types of metrics that need to be pulled in the data sources that need to be pulled in and actively discussed with each status call or each you know monthly report or whatever it may be to make sure that we aren't saying yeah this conversion rate's amazing we're killing Mm -hmm. it when and you wouldn't even know unless you asked what the actual goal was that that they should be paying attention to. Yeah, unless you ask. How many times do we do this? I've been guilty of this, like shooting from the hip as a marketer. You're just like, okay, let's get that email out. But then yeah. you take a step back. And I love it now because on the team, like people r- will remind me if I'm like, gonna, I'm starting to like go for that pistol. And they're like, okay, cool, cool. Uh, real quick, cool, cool, what cool. are you shooting at again? What are we trying to do? And I'm like, oh, yeah. good call. And I, yeah. I, you need that reminder to say, hold on. What, what is your goal? And sometimes it answers your question for you when you just know what your goal is. Yeah. One size does not fit all. Right. Ever anymore. Because <laughs> every, every brand is so unique these days. If you're thinking of two different um, beer companies, beer yeah. brands, their struggles are not the same. Like a Sierra Nevada or um, we have Cali Craft here in Walnut hmm. Creek versus a uh, like Coors Light or, yeah. you know, one of these bigger brands, their struggles are not the same, even though it's there. I know that all the beer people out there are like, it's not the same type of beer. I know that, but there it's beer there and they have different challenges, especially sure. in this environment right now with the pandemic. Totally so, get it. Totally makes sense. I've seen, I've seen like two different companies and one gets their leads from a partner mostly. Mm -hmm. Another one gets their leads organically, mostly. So at a time like this, you will have some, and maybe the partner relationship is a little dry right now. Maybe it isn't, but like 
you, you don't know. It's like looking at the neighbor's lawn and thinking yeah. it's all great, but maybe they've got ants, but you've got gophers or I don't know what. Exactly. Little creatures, yes. but like, you don't know, like you've got pine trees. I don't know this, this tangent. This, yeah. <laughs> I had pine trees. Okay. I just got to share. I had pine trees in the front yard. And my grass was terrible. And I was like that yard. We, we tried, oh, but we had like that yard where the grass would always die. And we only bothered you too and no one else. Yes, uh, probably. But, um, <laughs> but somebody advised me like, oh, there's those two massive pine trees in the front that pine trees make it the ground acidic. No idea. Oh. <laughs> I'm a marketer. I'm not a treeologist. So, uh, <laughs> um, so they're like, yeah, if we get rid of those pine trees, um, it opens up the grass but also it's less a- acid and so anyways it's like those kind of things so that's a problem i have whereas another neighbor might have a completely different problem so different exactly. brands to your point have just have their own unique challenges what is your is your lawn flourishing now I, I yeah need to know. no it's important uh, you know it <laughs> is but i i think i think some other i think like the gophers have moved in or something it's like oh, a constant God. battle i don't oh. i can't win I need to move. I just need to move. Brutal. I got to get out of here. <laughs> Let's go. Brutal. <laughs> uh, crazy. How's yours? How's your grass? Is it good? Do you have grass? <laughs> um, I, we do have grass. We live in a condo community. And so thankfully we don't manage. It's somebody else's problem. <laughs> somebody else's problem, which is great. That is But great. now we're going on a totally different tangent. We have this, um, it's called Arrow Garden. Not sponsored. Arrow Garden. Not yet. That- Arrowgarden.com. What's it? What is Arrow- it? Arrowgarden.com. Not a client. Um, and I actually recently gave it to my husband because I'm a professional plant killer, period. And a killer? Like you kill them? Killer. We, yeah. we, I cannot keep plants alive. And so this arrow garden thing, you, you plant the little, or you put the little pods in their spots. And then okay. the, the device automatically tells you when you need more water and it tells you when it needs more sunlight. And so what? we have all these herbs that are just flourishing in our kitchen right now. So what we all need to do is just have a giant arrow garden in our front and backyard so that like, I'm, forget the sun. I'm just I'm sold. You yeah. like they should, if not hire you, sponsor you, something. Yeah. I'm arrow A E R O. You got it. I'm totally yeah. gonna get one of these things. After different the show. mod. Mo- there's different models. You can get. You can go for the herb option. <laughs> you can go for the vegetable garden option. It's gr- big hit. Your wife will yeah. love it. Well, they get kind of pricey though, huh? I yeah. I got a deal though. It's like a Mother's Day deal, but I got it for my husband. Oh well, that's that's smart. Oh, you, it starts at a hundred. I think I yeah, mean, and I think that there was like a twenty percent off sale. Oh, yeah, but it, yeah. but it, if it's like dummy proof, I and mean, that's what I would need. I once grew carrots in a garden as a kid. And I forgot yeah. to pick. I forgot to get them. I forgot about them. <laughs> so I just grew carrots in the backyard, and they probably oh, multiplied. On the you never saw them. Never saw them. No. Out of sight, out of mind. So you know what the the people in the house now probably have a carrot problem <laughs> probably just carrots everywhere They're like where do these carrots come from awesome it's because i planted them years ago and never picked them so they probably that, and now that's their problem now right? it's their problem <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <laughs> so carrots are flourishing but they didn't ask for that they they didn't they didn't and that, somehow we'll tie that back into brand right yeah um, yeah <laughs> amazing so where were we well uh, this is cool though i like the arrow guard in fact that's why i like a podcasting and in these conversations because you never know what you're going to learn. I'm totally going to get someone in Arrow Garden for Christmas. It's happening. They're going to be very grateful. I mean, our dill is out of control. Seriously. Seriously. Yes. I might do parsley's like, coming in hot. Oh, parsley. I might yeah. do something like basil or something like that. Yeah. Oh, they give you it's basil, mint. I mean, there's two different kinds of basil. Yeah. But if you call it basil, it sounds like you're basil. British. You're like, yeah. Important. Two different kinds of basil. Yes. See, I, it already it already worked. And I wish we could put say we put it in food. We actually put it in cocktails. Oh hell yeah, that's fine. It's it's amazing. That's not fine. so much the dill. Dill goes in other things. Yeah. But yeah. Not so much. We had a birthday party and we had these little like tea sandwiches for for my daughter's birthday party. It was pretty. Oh cool. fine. Yeah. Does so she like a <laughs> pig or like what? What's like a British? Yeah, well, it's just like out of the Downton Abbey tea time cookbook. It was like all so she had a little proper, little proper oh, birthday party. It's kind of cute. I love that. Good for her. Crazy. Yeah, right. Awesome. Craziness. So, 
we're talking about marketing, but you yeah, know what? Are. Honestly, this ties in. You know how this ties in? Tell me. Garden, how in the heck are they going to be able to measure the ROI on the hardcore marketing show, having I'm, driven hundreds of people to check this thing out? I'll like, tell you. You won't, are, you won't know, would you? Or how would you know? Tell me. Well, there's there are specific tools that um, hmm. there's different. So I'll name drop one, pod sites. Um, I'm not sure if your podcast shows up on pod sites, but they have the ability to attribute orders and revenue or whatever conversion um, it may be back to the actual podcast. Neat. Check it out. Yeah. I'll check that out. We, we are running uh, a couple of podcast campaigns. Okay. A component, um, podcast component on some of our campaigns. That's smart. That's smart. Yeah. Different medium, different messages, different ways yes. of people to uh, consume content for sure. Uh, Especially right, right now. Yeah. Let me take you back to the data conversation because all this data is getting together. Um, I think one of the places we were going to, that was the idea of tools like Datarama. Also not a sponsor yet, but like the one thing I don't know too much about. So I'd love to hear your take on, you know, what's the, what's the idea? We've been talking about getting all the data in one place. Does CRM not do that? And where does the Datarama type tool come into play? Yes. So we use Datarama for our data visualization. Um, ah. It is our tool where we aggregate all of our data together. There's a little bit of cleanup that's involved. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And then there are widgets that you basically populate that data into and it creates these, you know, very intuitive data visualizations. We don't need anything fancy in the marketing and advertising world when it comes to visualizations. Storytelling, the best storytelling with a campaign can be done with very simple visualizations. The best visualization, in my opinion, is a trending chart. Ooh. You can see the impact of, even if it's just impressions, orders, and visits stacked on top of each other over time. It could be year over year, it could be just from year to date. It's so impactful to see what the impact of a campaign is on um, the actual client's orders and, and visit data. Right. So it, it allows you to be able to see when that spike happens and when, if there's a promotion in place or something mm. like that. And you can also see, people don't think about this, the drop-off, the eventual drop-off after the campaign ends. So all of you, you know, agencies and um, publishers out there keep looking at the reporting and the data after the campaign ends, because it's an excellent way to say, hey, look at what happened a couple of months. You don't want it to, to drop off immediately, right? You want the long tail effect of people seeing, um, keeping the actual brand in mind over time, because that's what your campaign's supposed to do. But eventually there will be a drop off. And if you aren't reinforcing the uh, awareness and consideration piece, then that's an opportunity to, you know, get those dollars back and start the drop off right away afterward or is there some kind of residual that the the traffic might drop off pretty significantly especially if you're spending a lot of money um yeah. especially with social and social as a if your brand is very active on social uh we have one client where instagram is their everything really um, Yes. Uh, their, their community is very, very active on Instagram. So I would it's think- like a pro It's like a, a purchasable B2C product kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. cool. And I, so I wouldn't expect their performance from a, a visit and order standpoint to drop off immediately from like an organic or direct channel standpoint right. from a- um, eventually there would be, I think, a pretty significant drop off if we stopped advertising. Yeah. Tell me about Instagram. Are you on it? Yes, I am. Uh, have you ever bought anything off of it? Uh, not like, have I seen an ad and purchased it? Yeah. Purchased the item? Yes. Yes. Many times. I have too. I feel like they have my number. I feel like they, more than Facebook and all these other, I, and one day I, I shared this earlier with, with someone, I bought two things and was about to buy a third and was like, what? I need to get off of here run away quickly. Yeah. yeah. They, with retargeting and the, all of the data that Facebook has, as everyone knows, Facebook owns Instagram. Right. With all of the data that you 
put out there about yourself and how you dance around your social media all day or at night, whenever you, whenever you, um, are on the tool or whenever you're on the platform, yeah, it is collecting all that information about you. And it is saying you love food and recipe type of, um, brands or mm-hmm. products. We're going to show you that type of content. Or, um, if you have kids, I think whenever I got pregnant, um, you know, two years ago, I suddenly was getting all these maternity ads, all of these, you know, baby clothes, all these baby products. And it's because of my behavior. It's what I was looking at. I was looking at specific products. Uh, um, I was going to say, there's no like category on Facebook that says like, I'm pregnant, but you're right. You would, your actions would be something that categorize you you as pregnant. Yeah. Single people don't go looking for like bottle Mm -hmm. bottles and no. Yeah. <laughs> but if you are, you know, if you are about to gift someone, you know, a new mom something, you might just start to, you might start to fall into that category just by browsing. Oh, that's a good point. I wonder but, if they then inadvertently think that you're pregnant, but you're not, you're shopping for a friend and how they figure out the difference between the two. Hmm. Well, I think that there is an option on Instagram to say this ad isn't relevant to me. Yeah. I like saying that. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I wonder what the difference is because, because you're right. It's owned by Facebook and I had the hardest time on Facebook for a while because all the display ads, I wasn't going to click on them, but they also weren't relevant. Maybe because I hadn't liked enough stuff and they didn't know enough about me. So it was really just kind of a waste. And so I remember particularly one day like, okay, I need to like a bunch of stuff that I actually like. So at least they'll be entertaining, you know? And I did. And eventually it did, but I feel like Instagram was so much faster, almost if it maybe was more activity based and than Facebook, maybe the, the advertisers are time? smarter on there, like your, like your clients and whatnot. Do you spend more time on Instagram? Uh, probably 50, 50. Okay. Yeah. I think the other thing is, um, client or brands and agencies have become a lot smarter when it comes to the creative understanding, which sure. card. So each of those slides, you know, you, you flip through a brand's, um, pictures, like ads, whatever you see that post. And if you click on a specific one there, that could be part of a larger test. They're trying to understand, potentially Uh. trying to understand which ad are people most drawn to? Is it the dark and rustic one? Is it the light and bright (laughs) one? Is it the lifestyle version or is it the product version? And eventually if you start to click on those and if you, you are probably acting very similar to other people in your, you know, demographic um, interests, you will start to see that people, that the brand will probably start serving more of those ads because they see that it's doing well. Yeah. And I like that. I, I, I kind of like the idea of being slightly tempted as I'm scrolling through, as opposed to being annoyed, you know, you see it like, yeah, I'm going to buy that thing. Stop wasting the year in my, but you're like, Ooh, I might buy that. Um, One was like this map where you scrape off different states that you visit and different countries you visit in the world. Yeah. Somehow they they had me pegged like, you like to adventure. I'm like, oh, yes, I do. And they're like, here, take this thing. Um, Yeah. yeah, A lot of different, really cool, tempting items. And oh, actually, to your point, you mentioned the different tests and the different, it was was like a poster. It's kind of like the metal sheet posters. Um, like metal they sort of somehow make it have the poster on the front of it and there was one that was like a spartan or something it looked really cool and i clicked through and i looked at a bunch of them and later on instagram the first three slides were the things that i i liked the most yes and then it had their standard default stuff yeah yeah you're being retargeted (laughs) totally it's kind of nice to like sometimes you get distracted too and you actually were interested in that product so yeah it, it is sometimes nice to be retargeted with that product. Right. And it's, I know we, I, we just talked about tests too. So t- testing is super important. And yeah, tell, tell me your approach to testing. Yeah. Well, with every client, we always have a measurement and learning plan. We want to make sure it's very clear to both parties what we are going to be measuring, the data sources that are incorporated, the types of ob- objectives we're trying to accomplish Um, and then we associate tests along with that too. So if they, if we, or the brand wants to learn something specific about the creative that they are going to be running, what, what is the super ad that should be running evergreen style that always performs well? 
What should we then test that against? Are you going to be launching a new product? So we're laying out the groundwork to say, here's the type of creative effort that needs to be incorporated timeline wise, budget Mm -hmm. wise into this plan so that we are putting forth the best creative possible because I mean, what is an an advertising campaign if the the creative isn't strong? It is what is that and targeting are the most important factors with a campaign. What is targeting and, and what? Targeting and creative. Got it. Two most important factors. What I love hearing about this is the the time spent planning. And I think sometimes, again, back to that shooting from the hip, just a little bit of forethought, a little bit of planning. We talked about objectives, but also the targeting and then the creative, mm-hmm. just a little bit of thinking about it. So we're not just testing some random subject line or some random value prop, you know, in the right. end. Exactly. And we, we can only do so much with the budget that we're given. So we want to make sure that we're prioritizing the type of targeting and aligning with the brand on the targeting that we can test too. What are some different areas? So should we test, you know, celebrities and should we test um, friends of fans? There's all Mm. these different targeting tactics that can be done some of the some of them perform well some of them don't and i think the biggest thing is we can't just assume that a specific creative or a specific targeting tactic is going to perform well just because we we think it will or we've seen it perform well in the past we do need to continue testing it to make sure that we have the latest information on what is running and why right. and the best way to say why is with data Trust right. the data. Yeah, you know, you don't want to act like, oh, this worked well. This worked well on America Online, so I'm sure it'll work well n- now. It's like, guys, we're this is a totally. This is a couple decades later. It's exactly. A totally way of going through things like this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the being in in the middle of a, a global pandemic too, it really starts. We, we pivot, we have to pivot advertising as well. Yeah, tell me out about of that. Home, yeah. Well, out of home was supposed to be a large component on a, a plan that we were working on um, over the summer. And we are turning toward connected TV more because people are interacting with their devices, they're on connected TV, and they're also um, on social more than ever. So, what we thought was going to be the place, the perfect place for, you know, these, this creative, the, the advertisements is not necessarily the case now. And with the pandemic, we don't know what's going to happen. And also with the election, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, In a normal yeah. year, we have um, seasonality that we can keep in mind with a brand based on how they have performed in the past. That's kind of, it's a little out the window based mm-hmm. on, we don't know if people are going to be leaving their homes in the fall. We're starting to all be able to leave our homes safely now. Right. And we also don't know what's going to happen with the election and let alone everything that's happened in the last week. Um, so a lot of, a lot of elements can really impact planning. So when you have that level of uncertainty, how do you, do you just plan for all different kinds of outcomes or how do you approach it? Yeah. Yeah. Basically you, you plan to be able to pivot quickly and Got connected it. TV is a really great example of that. Programmatic in general is a great example of that. Social, we can pull and launch campaigns very quickly digitally. So the more we can lean into that, the better. Um, mail, obviously, direct mail is not something that's we're going to be pushing right now just because of the pandemic. I know that there's been some research, research that says that um, you know the virus doesn't live on actual products as long or something like that, but that's still not something we'll be pushing right now. And yeah, people are leaving their mail out, you know, yeah, it's just kind yeah. of a funky thing. Um, yeah, so we are, yeah. we're keeping an eye on cancellation policies. We, we, there's a plan A, B, and C sometimes to make sure that we are able to pivot quickly and the clients aren't stuck with an ad somewhere because that could be a nightmare for yeah. them. Yeah, it really could. Huh. Uh, I like one of the things you said. You said plan for quick pivoting, uh, or in a manner of speaking, that's what I wrote down. The the yeah. fact that you can at least plan for that, so that you're ready to ready to move. It's not like, uh oh, this isn't working. What do we do, guys? We're gonna have to pivot. It's like, no, 
one of these things probably isn't going to work or something's going to happen. So let's just be prepared to make some changes or to your point, pick different channels that allow you to move more quickly than others. Right. And if there are certain opportunities right now where we can lean into other areas that we normally wouldn't lean into, like mm. partnering with a delivery service, that's not something we would have felt was top of mind, but now it makes a lot of sense for some of the brands that we work with. So right. um, again, though, being able to pivot quickly, if that delivery service starts to have negative reviews or something like that, we have to be able to um, get in and out of placements pretty quickly right now. Right. Right. Okay. Sweet. Where, where do you see this going? Where, you know, we're talking a little bit about you know, what we're doing now and pivoting in the future. Are there any strategies coming around the bend or anything you're kind of excited about coming, coming down the lane in the future? Yeah. From, so f because I'm such a Nick data nerd and measurement is such a yeah. an important aspect to everything that we're doing. There's two things I'm really excited about. Okay. One is social listening. That's not something that agencies have really owned before. Some agencies have, some agencies haven't. It just doesn't, sometimes it makes sense for their client base, sometimes it doesn't. For us, it's starting to make a lot more sense based on the types of topics that people are discussing and how sometimes those go viral. So having a social listening tool to understand what the sentiment and overall conversation is like about these specific brands is so important to be able to convey that back to the client quickly and also set alerts if there is a topic that or a, a tweet or something that's going viral. It's PR and reputation management. So yeah. social listening is, is something that um, we are really diving into. And could you describe, yeah, sorry, could you describe like the, what is that social for listening. someone who doesn't necessarily know, haven't, haven't bumped into that? Yeah. So it's a tool that basically scrapes the internet. Um, so you, they can look at, it's all public data too. It doesn't look at anyone's private data. It allows the tool, so the, the tool pulls in um, Twitter comments, Facebook, Instagram, reviews, so um, Reddit, a bunch of different sources, wow. um, blogs, you know, Tumblr, all these different sources, anything behind a paywall and anything that's private, set to private on socials is not pulled in. And then from there, they're able to look at the actual sentence level and parse out each word to say, to categorize it, to say this is positive or this is negative uh, to understand what the total sentiment is. And Got it. You know, it's like one big pie. This is the chunk that's positive, and these are the type of keywords associated with it. And here's what's negative, and also being able to see it trending wise. I love trending charts. So trending wise, right. where the giant spike in uh, people talking about the brand was it positive or negative, and was it associated with a specific day? Um, there's there are so many opportunities to isolate those specific spikes and either recreate it or avoid it with advertising. Uh, got it. Okay. Social listening, something to keep your eyes on, especially as more and more of us are staying home and getting vocal on, on social platforms and reddits and the G2 crowds and all those things being aware and more than just kind of casually scrolling, but having a good sense for sentiment to your point, how is it going? Are we doing well? Or are they thinking that we're like the cable company you know, and everyone hates right. it? Let's, let's look at it. It's also a really great way to look at what competitors are doing and what are they doing well and what are they doing not so well that maybe your product is a great performer in that the ads yeah. can capitalize on. So one example of that is we have a client who has headphones and we were doing a competitive analysis to see what their competitors headphones, uh, the, the feedback was like online. And one of the, the pieces of feedback was the lifetime value of this is awful. I have to repurchase this item every three months. And so one suggestion that we had for our client with their headphones was if your product lasts a long time, talk about the lifetime value and how it mm. might be an upfront investment, but you're investing in a product that's going to last years. So, uh, and if you're using it every single day, like we all are right now, with Zoom and conferencing, whatever, every single day, it's an important product to have. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, 
that's that's smart, right? Finding out there's there's a weakness going on over here, and this is a natural strength for us. But helping people understand that that should be the conversation. Yes. Maybe they're talking about, hey, they're shiny, they're black, and I love how the cord feels or whatever it feels. Yeah. No cord, but like, okay, cool. How about how long has that lasted for you? Long yeah. time, huh? Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah we it really has. Really I can't wait to share that. Oh yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> totally. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So keeping an eye on what other people are saying about other products or just the usefulness of a tool or whatever the, the product or, you know, offering is for a brand allows them to be able to customize the messaging within creative. Yeah. Own that conversation. Mm-hmm. Are the competitors a stick in the mud? Are they ever happy to talk to you? Do you enjoy talking to them? Um, shaping that conversation. That's cool. I like it. Taking it, taking control of the situation rather than just being a victim. Oh no, they're talking about us on social. Like you could be out in front of that. Exactly. Um, hiding from it. Exactly. Yeah. You, there are so many use cases with social listening. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to look into all the different opportunities that are available with it. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. The thing, I mean, in so many things going on these days and uh, the future, you know, we'll, we'll get through all this thing, but there's all sorts of different cool opportunities coming, you know, coming toward us that we can mm-hmm. take advantage of. So social listening, definitely. You got that one on my radar for sure. Anything else I should cool. keep, keep my eyes open for? I think attribution is becoming more and more important. Mm-hmm. I think it's been important for a long time. And I know that there are certain, you know, ways of thinking out there where one attribution method is, is, works well for one brand versus another brand. But once you do find the appropriate attribution tool for you, it can make a huge difference. So the attribution tool that we use incorporates all of the media data so they can understand, the client can understand the true impact of advertising on the actual client's brand. So from a channel perspective, from a creative perspective, what was the creative doing for the client's bottom line? So it pulls in the client's backend data as well. The amazing thing is that certain tools out there can also pull in seasonality or weather, um, weather patterns or COVID-19. What is, what are these elements actually doing for a client's brand and the activity behind the scenes. So attribution is, is something that we talk about all the time with clients and some, some are ready for it and some aren't. And it's, um, for those who aren't, it's all about education and baby steps. How do you get them into it? Because I think sometimes we could benefit from learning how to say things the right way to people who don't necessarily get it. So we get their buy-in. I think that the easiest way is when a client says, why is my backend data, my web analytics data telling me one thing and your campaign data telling me something else? Okay. That's because of attribution. So Google Analytics, for example, is all click-based. That's going to tell a different story than media analytics because that includes impression data, impression-based yeah. data. So the best way to then segue into an appropriate attribution tool conversation is to say, we would love to talk to you more about what sort of attribution methodologies and tools are out there and what sort of investment you're willing to put toward it to then be able to have speak the same language across the board to say, this is our source of truth. Mm -hmm. And it really is baby steps because when you are used to working at, um, looking at a your source of truth, whether it be Google Analytics or Adobe Omniture or whatever, then it's very difficult to shift that way of thinking and right. the um, data source to something else. So it is, it's a slow conversation. Yeah. Sometimes brands are not willing to look elsewhere for attribution and that's fine, but some are because they want to be able to speak the same language from a data perspective and attribution perspective with the agency. I mean, I'm, I get that some agencies are, going to try to sell you more things, but it, it really, it makes sense to be looking at different ways of attribution because I know for a fact that I don't think any of those Instagram products I bought were a direct click through. I think Correct. one, I sent it to a friend and sent it back to me. And I like, there was, there was no same device purchasing that was happening there. It, 
it was because of that ad, but it was not, you know, and, and I know, but, and it's not like I did it on purpose, but it's like, okay, I know that there's no click path to follow here. They're not going exactly. to, they're not going to know who, who it was. We all navigate our consideration process differently. Some people will go directly to the site and learn more. Other people will step away and think about it for a little bit. And that might require doing like going about your, it will go, will require going about your normal life, which will yeah. be looking at social media. And so if you start to see those ads more and more, it's going to be either you're going to be turned off or you're going to want to learn even more about the product. So we all navigate it differently. And just because that original ad didn't, it was at the very, very beginning of your consideration process, it should still be considered when we're thinking about attribution because it did have an impact on what the person's consideration process looked like for them to right. finally make that purchase. Right. Makes total sense. Um, not wanting to make absolute click tracking the one source of truth because when you do that, you may, you may alienate people and you may actually turn people off from the fact that they were going to buy, they're going to buy it in their own special way. Completely. And, you know, at least get the sale in as opposed to trying to throw a bunch of roadblocks in their way, all these little metric hoops they got to jump through. Totally. But I would, I will say that if a client is married to click-based attribution, yeah. great. We okay. will abide by that too. We will never say, no, we don't agree with that. We may say, have you thought about it this way? Have you considered thinking X, Y, Z? So you're saying you're nice. Never, you're not going to tell We're nice about hey, it. Hey, you're an idiot. <laughs> Look, we, do, we do this way more than you do. Let's go, people. <laughs> this is an unbiased perspective because you know, we- Just bring me on the call. Be like, you guys need to listen to her. Yeah, Stop Casey, it. <laughs> I'm on board. I got a 2 p.m. today. <laughs> yeah. Right, let me know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, we will work with any attribution methodology, right. of course, but do you have we a favorite? Do, have, do we have a favorite? Do you have a favorite? Yeah. Favorite. Well, so, uh, multi-touch attribution is my yeah. recommended and having it be impression based. Impression based. Impression based and not click based. Cause just, just as we were saying, if it's click based, you're missing out on all of those people who did not click on that ad in the first place, even though they saw it, they probably were like, huh, I don't, I don't know about that yet. I'm not ready to check it out. I'll check right. it out later. Yeah. That ad never got any sort of credit, which is fine. I think that with multi-touch attributions too, and having it, it can be, you know, an agency can do it themselves or they can outsource it. Having it be outsourced also removes this bias, mm -hmm. right? You have these, you have another party doing it. So the client knows that we aren't investing in multi-touch attribution to get more dollars. We're doing it to help you truly understand what the appropriate marketing mix is right. and what the invested investment should be across all of these channels with this creative, with this audience targeting, with data, actual, actual attribution data behind it rather than saying, right. well, we think that this performed well from a click-based perspective. Having the impression data provides that additional layer inclusive of um, advertising. Right. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Awesome. I, you know, my next question, who are you? How did you become this data visualization wizard? Like, <laughs> can you take us back? Take us back, back in, back in the day, little Emily, what was it like growing up? Where'd you grow up? Did you always want to be a marketer? Well, to take, tell us the story. Okay. Yeah. So I'm from the middle of nowhere in Illinois, very, very small town called Sullivan. It is a town of 4,000 people, two stoplights, you know, a couple of fast food restaurants, a couple of restaurants. And now were they oh full stoplights or were they like the blinky ones? Full stoplights. I oh, know we, we hey. had two full stoplights, a that's really impressive. cute square like town square oh that's um, awesome it was it's one elementary school one middle school one high school so you who you were was kind of who you were for your entire mm. life in this small town and i right. have two older brothers too so who i was my reputation like they kind of created it for me right like a you. And, yeah yes so um my dad was a farmer and I, I think that I got my work, my, my 
mentality of just working really hard mm. and executing from my dad because he was up at 5 a.m. every single day checking on the fields and then meeting up with his friends at like 9 a.m. for coffee and they'd already worked like four hours that morning. Um, he worked really, really hard. And I think that's where I get a lot of my um, ambition from because yeah. – I saw it. And my mom too. My mom was an accountant and she, tax season is insane for accountants and she would be working so hard during tax season. So um, yeah, I feel like I got a lot of my ambition from them. Yeah. What did he grow? He grew uh, corn and soybeans. Yep. Good old corn. Did you have your own grain bins and all that? And Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Wow. Grain huh. bins, a couple of sheds combines tractors yeah no, no potatoes as well just strictly corn and soy just strictly corn and soybeans and the farm the farms around where my dad farmed had animals you know pigs and cows yeah and yeah horses um but yeah we just did corn and soybeans so wow. yeah so like small town living yeah and you busted out of the the farm path for sure i did i had two older cousins so i have two older brothers uh, who went to a local, uh, went to University of Illinois. And because of that, I kind of felt like I grew up at University of Illinois and I wanted to sort of break out of what I already knew. And I also had two cousins, I have two cousins who are six and nine years older than me, I think, 10 mm -hmm. years older than me. And I looked up to them my entire life. They're from St. Louis. They went to Georgetown. It was nice. so different than how I grew up. <laughs> sure. I just wanted to be them. I wanted to be like them. And so I, I just kind of, I asked them for guidance when I could. They were my uh -huh. mentors for sure. I still feel like they are my mentors. From they like were a cousins, you said? Perspective. They were from what? And they said they were cousins? They're cousin. They're my cousins. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And one of them lived in Chicago. And so I decided that after a half, half, after a semester of going to a community college, I was a little nervous to break out of my bubble in central Illinois. <laughs> but then after attending one of their weddings and seeing all the friends they had and all these memories they were talking about, mm. all these big things, I was like, I got to go. I got to get out of here. I'm going to go up to Chicago, which is where one of my cousins lives. She's also my godmother. And I was nauseous for like a week. I was so afraid of being in the city and I was, I was so shy. So it was one of the best things that I've ever done though, no breaking out of the, the mold that I, you know, was supposed the life I was kind of supposed to live and going to going outside my comfort zone and seeing different types of people and yeah. different religions and understanding what business school really meant and where, where these, um, you know, different degrees could lead people. I initially started actually in psychology oh, no and then I, I flipped it to marketing. My parents were like, you really need to just, you need to go into marketing. You need to go into business school because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. So I you're just trying, not. like trying stuff out. Like you didn't yes. necessarily want to be like a psychologist or something. You're just like, that sounds fun. Studying people's yeah. motivation. and Yeah. Behavior, yeah. whatever it may be. It was kind of like teetering on sociology and psychology. Oh yeah, totally. And I realized, I don't think I want to do this anymore. It's a lot harder than I thought it was. Yeah. How so? Psychology and sociology. Because you also, well, at Loyola, in Chicago, you also have to go down this path of like a science path. You have to learn about the mm. brain and all of oh, these. Geez. And I was like, I, you know, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. So then I went to marketing and um, I still wasn't like, this is it. This is what I want to do. And I was very nervous about that. I, I was right. so paralyzed by not knowing what I wanted to do. And um then, you know, a little by little, I got some internships and sort of realized what I didn't want to do with marketing. Mm -hmm. And then I fell into analytics and totally hit the ground running, realized how much I loved it. And looking back, my mom's a CPA. I am so uh, much like my mom. Numbers are comforting numbers. to me. I don't want yeah. the debate. I want the facts and right. the data is a, you know, it's all factual. So I am so much like my mom in that way where I'm comforted by the facts. 
Do you remember when you first sort of were exposed to analytics and that side? Yeah. Was it gradual or was it kind of like, do you remember like angels and harps and singing from the <laughs> heavens or was it kind of like, huh, you did more and more of it over time kind of thing? What was it I, like? It was gradual. It was gradual. Yeah. I, um, I had an internship at cars.com and then I went over cool. after I graduated to apartments.com. And one of the elements of my role was to update a spreadsheet every week. <laughs> and I was terrible at it. Absolutely terrible. Didn't even know how to QA it. Awful. My manager worked with me and helped <laughs> me understand how to QA it. And if he didn't take the time to do that, then another person wouldn't have noticed that I was pretty good at it. Eventually I was pretty good at it. He left and brought me over to a company called Centro. And okay. that's where I became a campaign analyst. And that's where I really realized, oh my gosh, there's so much awesome data behind advertising campaigns. Yeah. You can see all of this amazing information. And then I was very nervous to speak to clients at first. Something about it really intimidated me. And then little by little, I realized I actually really like talking to clients. <laughs> right? I don't like the middleman involved. I right. want to hear the facts straight from them or the questions straight from them and then speak to them directly and uh, little by little, I also started to um, grow a team, grow an analytics team. And I realized how much I loved being a manager. Wow. And um, yeah, it's, it's so analytics and managing is, yeah, what I love. And I'm, I'm really glad that I've, I'm really glad I found it. Yeah, seriously. It, what, when you find that sweet spot where you feel like you're going to get in trouble for playing all day, yeah. it's awesome. It's a really it's cool. amazing. Yes. And they... If you are an analyst, I think one of the best characteristics you can have is curiosity. Mm. If you are curious, that's amazing because it's going to lead you down these different rabbit holes with data to uncover really cool things. And if you, that's my big motivation too, finding that aha moment with data and sharing it with people that they otherwise wouldn't have seen, that's really cool. So if you are thinking about analytics or love numbers and you are super curious and you're listening, I absolutely encourage you to go down the campaign analytics route. Mm. Yeah. The, the aha moment. It's like you're a detective on a TV show and you've like cracked the case or you've just like bewildered a bunch of people are like, wow, how did you know that? Like Sherlock yeah. Holmes, like the Sherlock Holmes of marketing. Like how did you even know that, that was the case. Oh, no, this over here totally. and, this, and this over here. And I noticed it all. And, and there's something, again, super comforting about being able to say, well, let me show you. I have all the yeah. data and I can walk you through it. And, right. and they have the aha moment too. Right. And then we all have the collective aha moment together. It's really cool. Um, That's a good point. It's not just you having some gut feel and people being, I don't know if it's right or not, but let's go with it. It's like, yeah, no, this is this, this is not a feel per se as much as it is like, this is what I've put together. Let me show yes. you my logic. And then they, I, I totally get that, right? You're sharing yeah. the aha with them. So it's not just this, your own, you get to feel it, but they get to feel it too. And it feels good sharing. Yeah, that with folks. yeah. exactly. Wow. Yeah. Neat. Where yeah. did you go to Beijing? I saw you did like a study course there. I did. Yeah. Um, I think it was like an actual, it was an MBA program, but they let undergrads go too. They like, they let a certain number of undergrads go. And so wow. it was international marketing it was a couple of weeks and it was, it was during when the, uh, they were preparing for the Olympics back in 2008. Really? So it was a really cool time to go. They were trying to figure out how to uh, clean up the quality of air. So there was a whole system with only certain people could drive on certain days to help, you know, with these, it was the did summer. Did it work? Olympic. Yeah, it totally did. Really? Yeah. Good. So, we wouldn't want to cold. be walking around just breathing in like bad air all day. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a ton of like smog and, and everything. So the fact that they were able to clean it up in time for the Olympics yeah. is pretty incredible. So yeah, it was an international marketing course. We had a project, we were touring all over the place, which was amazing. And then we had a project in the end. I, it's been so long. I can't remember what the project was, but I remember our topic um, that we chose was, um, using bamboo to create bicycles because it was sustainable and created a whole video around it. Nice. And there weren't many people doing, it was back when 
you know, everyone had their Max and the iMovie was a big thing. Yes. And so we were like, we're going to do an iMovie and really wow everyone. Nice. We were like the young undergrads compared to these MBA students. And it was cool. It was, it, I, I'm pretty sure we got a good grade on it. Yeah. I love that stuff. It's out of the box. You know, the, the boring MBAs are probably like, let's arbitrage the, uh, the cost of silicone and uh, Full presentations. And we were like, that is so cool. I think everyone was like appreciated yeah. the other person's space, you know, like their right. spot in the, in the room. Right. Um, the young kids were doing the young innovative thing. And then the, you know, older MBA students were more polished because they were, they were you know, had the experience in the workplace and they right. knew how to present something appropriately. And we were just, you know, in all of them. And um, true, I could see that like sharply dressed, they know how to present. You're just like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> how do totally. I get to be like, there? That looks uh, really yeah. cool. I want to be like them. It was cool. It was I'm blending undergrads with MBA students is mm. so smart. I don't know if this is a common thing, that but a good idea. It's awesome. Um, it allow it like it feels like you're almost there, and you feel like these people are just like me. I'm not I, like they're super smart. Like yeah. foundationally, they are great people. Yeah, and they just worked really hard. I can do that too, and I feel like that's the moral of you know everyone's career too. When you look back as the senior director of analytics and business intelligence, when you look back, you know you you wish you could tell yourself it's okay. Just keep working hard and keep looking up to your mentors and using them as a guide because everyone, there's a room for everybody to succeed or, you know, success is different to everybody too. For me, it's happiness and just being yeah. able to provide for my kids. And I, I just wish every young person could know that. Take a deep breath. It's all going to be okay. Continue looking to your mentors. That's really, really important. And mentors can be different types of people. It doesn't have to be someone you work with. It could be your cousins. Like it was for me. They yeah. were older than me and I just, I wanted to be like them and it, it, it motivated me. Um, so just keep, keep working hard, keep being curious, you know, being a constant student, even though you don't know, if you don't know what you want to do, that's okay. Part of the battle is in the beginning is figuring out what you don't want to do. I realized mm. I did not love trade marketing at all but I eventually made it to advertising and now I see it's a, it's such a good fit for me. Yeah. It's so true that eliminating the nose can be just as powerful. You know, if you, if you know for sure, I hate doing that. I do not yeah. want to do that at all, but giving it a shot too. Yeah. Maybe just need, need some training and then you actually yeah. fall in love with it. Yeah. And if, even if you get your degree in marketing, there's so many different ways that you could go. I got my degree in marketing, but I'm in advertising. And if you don't love B2C, you could try B2B. There's so many different ways um, that you can just keep trying and you'll find yeah. something eventually. Yeah. Eventually you get there. Yeah. And, uh, or, or maybe you're always trying new things, but you, but you get there to the point where you, you at least know that what you're doing is fun or just feels yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Um, how can people connect with you? People want to reach out, learn more from you. Maybe you're their cousin. <laughs> you know, maybe <laughs> they can learn from you and just either connect or follow you. What are the social sites, URLs for Media Matters and all that? Yeah. Um, Media Matters. I need to look at the URL. Wait. WW, I think, right? Media Matters, www.com. Yeah. Um, social, so LinkedIn, Emily Sanders Lee, it's with, it's E-M-I-L-I-E, -I not E-M-I-L-Y. It's a cool way to spell it. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So that's really important. I think if people call me Emil because they don't, you know, it, I tell my mom every day, why did you spell my name with an I-E? Um, Especially yeah, the e LinkedIn spammers who are like, hi, Emil, I want to do business with you. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Connect with me. No. Yeah. Instead, hey, Emily, I heard you on the podcast. I would love to. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Much better. Yeah. The last thing I would tell people too is don't forget to volunteer. That's oh yeah, tell me more about that. Because I know you, you do a lot of volunteering. I do a lot of volunteering. I'm the uh, co-chair for the East Bay Walk to End Alzheimer's. And I am also on the advocacy team for um, the, you know, representing my specific area in um, the East Bay. Yeah. So that's basically advocating for certain bills. Um, and 
legislation to help in various areas with, um, you know, patients or caregivers yeah. um, who work with loved ones with Alzheimer's. And so I, if you are also kind of figuring out where to, where you fit best in the workplace, or you're still trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. volunteering is an amazing way to obviously do something really great for the organization. And with the pandemic, there's so many opportunities to do tons of different things at home, whether it's helping them with their marketing efforts or da data entry or making phone calls. So super true. easy. Stuffing envelopes, so, whatever it is. Yeah, totally. Whatever. It, yeah. And so we, what people don't realize is what they get out of it. So you learn to work with people you otherwise wouldn't have come in contact with. And that really helps you in the workplace because it, it makes you have to work with, adapt to different personalities. Yeah. So that's one great thing. And then the other thing is you, you make your network even bigger because you wouldn't have, you likely wouldn't have come in contact with those people. Right. Um, you also can sort of face your fears in a, in an easier way. Like if you are, if you are uncomfortable with public speaking, you kind of have nothing to lose in your volunteer efforts. As long as you present yourself well and you practice, mm -hmm. you, you're not going to get fired for volunteering. Um, right. so it's a really nice way to test out these different, um, fears like public speaking. I know that I was nervous about it years and years ago and volunteering really helped me with that. Um, so it's a, it's a safe environment to, to test those little fears in safe little doses. Right. Well, could you like maybe throw out the links or describe, you know, the, the group that you work with, the Alzheimer's group, do you, do you have like a URL for it or the name for it? We could link to that as well in the show notes. Yeah. The um, Alzheimer's Association website is ACT dot alls alz dot org and then from there you there are different opportunities that you can look into like there's the longest day there's the the walk to end alzheimer's and you can find your local walk obviously things are a little bit different this year because people can't walk in groups together so we're trying to yeah. figure that out they're trying to figure that out at the national level but there are still ways that you can help um help them out um and whenever you find your local walk or longest day group, there's a, a contact on there that you can reach out to, to say, what are the different opportunities that are available? And you don't have to do that with the Alzheimer's Association. It could be any organization. Just type in, you know, volunteer opportunities near me or the specific cause that you are looking for. And right. then keep finding, look at those locations, find the, the contact and just chat with them. I, I bet that they get back to you within 24 hours. Oh, I bet. Wow. Okay. Good. Good. Cool stuff. I, I, I think, you know, so much can be said for, you know, finding not only the thing that you love doing, but also the, the place that you can give back to. And I think contribution is so under, underappreciated. We don't talk about how much, I mean, everyone likes giving gifts at Christmas and birthdays. It's way more fun. I mean, it's cool getting neat things, but especially <laughs> as you get older, you can just buy it. Right. So you, yeah. Unless it's something crazy, but like usually it's like if I need something, I just go on Amazon and buy it. But the fact that someone cares, it's so much fun to give. So to volunteer is just more like the ultimate kind of gifting. Um, yeah. And so finding the thing that like resonates the most with you too, you know, um, whatever, whatever, you know, helping any group is great. But if you can help a group that has a mission that you're passionate about, man, that's like a triple win. It's amazing. It, yeah, there's benefits both ways, and I think. If you, if your family or a loved one has a disease that has no cure and you're watching that person, you know, sadly mm. progress, it is your ability to sort of have control over the situation and do something about it. Yeah. And I'm a long distance caregiver. And so I don't, obviously I can't see my mother anytime soon too, because she's over 60 years old, but by volunteering, I'm hosting a fundraiser with Kendra Scott this weekend. This probably okay. won't be up before this weekend, but no, <laughs> that's is um like that's it's the little things like that yeah. that can still be done to raise funds for these organizations who really really need it because a lot of these organizations their funding is being cut, so they yeah. need they need help. For sure. <laughs> so, have you been able to do Zo yeah. like Zoom chats and that kind of thing? Yeah, we have a monthly, um, we have a monthly meeting the first Wednesday of the month. So we all do a Zoom or sorry, Google Hangout. 
and there's always an agenda. So as the co-chair, I'm helping put together the agenda and working mm -hmm. with the different committee members to make sure that they're, they're on top of their, you know, to-do list or they're thinking of innovative ways to tackle, you know, this, this new situation with their right. specific area. So uh, yeah, we meet every Monday and then, or every first Wednesday of the month. And uh, we have social, like social groups that we're constantly posting in. So there's a bunch of different efforts happening all year round, even though it's just one annual walk. Crazy. All the, all yeah. the work that goes into it, but um, yeah. probably no regrets. Any of that, it's just totally worth it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, it's one of the best things that I've ever, ever done. I, I, I have this, you, you gain this village of people, like badass people who I consider such good friends now. And you have a connection with them, especially if it's for a, a cause that you feel really passionate about. Mm -hmm. You have that automatic connection with them. I think my first meeting where I met everybody, we always do an intro if there's anyone new in the group. I, I cried in front of mm -hmm. a room full of strangers because I, I was telling my story about my mom yeah. and all of them in the room were like us too. And then you get on with the com committee meeting, but to have that connection with everyone within 20 minutes of meeting them and it's an incredible thing to, you just feel empowered. You yeah. feel like you are really, really making a difference and you're doing it with incredible people. Again, you otherwise wouldn't have come in contact with. Um, so I, no regrets. I am, I love my, my village at the Alzheimer's association. There's something to be said for that. Um, with you're with like-minded people, but you're also with just good people, right? Not yeah. everyone volunteers. And a lot of us are good people, but we just haven't done it or we had on the time for it, but you're around other people who care and have stepped out of their house and their comfort zone to, to do it too. And you're yeah. right. You just in be, you end up with around just people that are just fantastic. I remember I did this like hike where you f raise money, you hike a tall mountain and um, it helps cool. get inner city kids. It's called big city mountaineers and you get um, at risk youth out of cities, hiking, you know, learning just in the woods, kind of like an outward bound thing, but it's like one to one incredible. with adults and mentors. And so what you do though, is you're like, I want to go climb Mount Rainier or something. And you raise a whole bunch of money, you get to go climb it and then, you know, take good photos and promote it, promote that thing. And then the kids get to go like have amazing adventures. It, so I, I, the whole point of that was, I remember meeting up with the rest of the people I was going to be climbing with and they're all really cool. And it's like, yeah. imagine that we all kind of get along because we all have a similar passion to your point and they're yeah. just people. They're probably better people than I, they're, for sure. They're better people. Than I, they're just like amazing. And you're like, no, oh, I get to hang out with these people and they don't kick me out. This is cool. I think that there's to, the imposter syndrome that we have in these volunteer environments. Sure. Like I look around, I'm like, these people are better people than I am. But yeah, right. No, They're amazing. We're all great people. You're there True. too. And the other comment that you had about like, I don't have time. I may not have time. I have zero time. Full-time job, two For kids, sure. like long time, long distance caregiver. But it doesn't require that much time. Even right. as the co-chair of the walk, it doesn't require that much time. And your, whenever you reach out to the organization that you're passionate about, let them know how much time you have. That way they're not asking you to do more than you're capable of. And you're still having, you're still gaining this community. You've mm -hmm. set expectations and oh God, it just feels good. It feels good to get, like give back and do your part. And I, if I would have said that to myself like 20 years ago, like to young Emily, I would have been like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to volunteer. No, I don't think that's for... I'm not that kind of person. And it's weird how we put people into boxes. Mm -hmm. And the, I just wish I could go back to that young Emily and been like, just try. Just because what, what you- What would you tell her? What would you tell her? Stop fearing what you don't know. Okay. I think that that's a big one. Being from a really, really small town and not having, you know, the being um, exposed to certain things yeah. in life. And I think that this happens a lot to a lot of people. We fear what we don't know. True. And that needs to stop. We cannot fear what we don't know. If you don't know about it, educate yourself. Yeah. Or shut your mouth. <laughs> or shut your mouth. Or shut your mouth. Or I love the inner city kids thing because you are, you are putting yourself in this environment with these kids. 
And suddenly you have a very, probably a very different view of who yeah. these kids are. No idea. And right. Like right. It, it, it's a beautiful thing. The more it that is. you educate and actually understand what you don't know, you start to kind of come around and have right. empathy. And I think that's the biggest thing in life. We got to be empathetic. It's not just about ourselves. It's about other people too. Totally. Um, so younger self too, I'd say, keep looking to your mentors to guide you. Mm -hmm. Um, if you don't have a mentor, that's okay. Just kind of look around and find someone who really inspires you and reach out to them just because they don't live right, you know, in your same area or you don't talk to them all the time. That's okay. I right. bet that if you reach out to anyone, listen, reach out to someone who inspires them. I guarantee that person would say, absolutely. I will be there for you. I would right. say that to anybody who comes to me, I'd absolutely be a mentor for anybody to help them. I was going to say, um, if you don't have a mentor yet, you're, t you're listening to two people who are happy to be a mentor. So <laughs> yeah, reach out to one you. of us. We're here for you. Um, and then I think as much as we're focused on, you know, if you're from that small town or even from a big city, if you're, you're so focused when you're younger on getting out and looking to the future and almost wishing that time away, yeah. don't do that because you don't know what's going to change in your future. You don't know the health of your loved ones and you don't know what's going to happen to them. Yeah. My, Appreciate my the mother, moment. Yeah. My mother doesn't know who I am anymore. Really? So if I could, she is, yeah, she knows I am like a special person in her mm. life because she treats me warmly when she sees me and my brothers and my children, and my husband, but she doesn't know who I am. Jeez. So yeah. So you don't, I wish I could go back to young Emily and say, hug her, hold yes. her. Totally. Talk to her, ask her about her parents, ask her about what you were like when you were a kid, get those, get this important information from her and make those memories because even though my mom can't remember, I can still remember. And yeah. so if you're young and wanting to like, just get to the future and be successful, stop and look around you and be grateful for what you have and the loved ones in your life right. because your circle will grow, but it may not look the same and those yeah. people may not look the same. So appreciate who you have in your life. A hundred percent. I think those are wise, wise words and people need to listen to them. Tap, tap, <laughs> tap, 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 tap. Are you listening? Listen, listen to those words. Um, <laughs> Emily, this has been awesome. It's been so much fun hanging out, chat and marketing, data, okay. analytics passions volunteering amazing thank you for having me this is awesome yeah we'll have to have you come back on here in a little bit and after we're all out of quarantine and talk yeah. about what's changed in the world and what the I latest love advertising data trends are showing year over year totally we have all these predictions but it could look completely different we'll could. see it yeah, could we shall see that. but we're not going to look toward the future too quickly we're just going to no. appreciate that we're going to live in the have. moment and appreciate totally. the silver lining moments right now, for sure. For, there, and there are some, for sure. Um, yeah. For those listening, if you've learned something, and I know you have, I freaking know you have, because I literally have two pages of notes over here. <laughs> I've ran out of space. I'm in like side margins over here. Um, <laughs> then share this episode with someone. Link them to it. Tell them, hey, check this thing out, especially if we're on the volunteering side, the data side, the analytics, the trends. Um, but don't just share it. Put your take on it. What are your takeaways? Put those in the LinkedIn, the top of the thing. Here's what I learned. Tag us, tag me, tag Emily, so we can comment there and start a conversation. But that's how you show thought leadership and really make a difference. So Emily, thank you again for being here. Awesome thank time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'll talk to you for soon. Sure. For sure. Yeah. For everyone, for everyone listening, this has been the Hardcore Marketing Show. We will catch you all next time.